Praise be Jesus and Mary. Now. Here in the octave of Christmas, the church asks us to reflect on the birth of our Savior and the gift of redemption and healing that he brings to us. The blessing of having Jesus Christ in your life is something that, unfortunately, many people are lacking today. With that thought in mind, I just want to take this opportunity to maybe help clarify what I think the recent church document, Fiducia Supplicans, is saying. It's the new declaration regarding the blessing of same-sex couples and other couples in irregular situations. It would be good for people, obviously, to read the document, not just listen to the commentaries on it. But whenever we read something from the magisterium, we need to have a spirit of openness and docility. We need to have a teachable spirit, essentially. Magister in Latin means master or teacher. Magisterium means teaching office. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me, Jesus says of his church in Luke 10, verse 16. The opposite of having a teachable spirit is being closed and suspicious and having a spirit of hostility instead of a spirit of docility, which unfortunately a lot of people have towards the Vatican and the Holy Father nowadays. It's a spirit that can easily lead to schism, believe it or not. It did so with Lefebvre in the 70s and 80s. It can do so again, even today. St. Thomas Aquinas says that whatever is received is received according to the mode of the receiver. In Latin, it's quid quid recipitur ad modem recipientis recipitur. So if I'm already disposed to be defensive or hostile towards the Vatican or the Holy Father, then I'm going to read to or listen to them with that filter of suspicion and criticism. So in essence, I probably won't be able to actually hear what's being said. And whenever I read a magisterial document or something from the magisterium that I don't quite understand, or I don't see how something can fit or square with church teaching, you know what do I do? I listen to people who actually do know how to harmonize recent magisterial documents with the perennial teachings of the church. Pope Benedict XVI called that the hermeneutic of continuity, which I think is lacking in a lot of places. One thing I don't want to do, though, is I don't want to publicly descend from or attack the Church or the Vatican or the Holy Father. That's actually a scandal. That's actually a sin against the unity of the Church. The document Fiducia Supplicans is very clear about what marriage is and what it isn't. It's also very clear that only sexual relations in a marriage are considered by the Church to be morally licit, i.e. not sinful. It's also very clear as it states in paragraph 5 of the document that, quote, the church does not have the power to impart blessings on unions of persons of the same sex, unquote. However, the document does talk about blessing couples in irregular or same-sex relationships, which is a new proposal. In the 2021 document from the CDF um, to the dubium of the doubts regarding the blessings of unions of persons of the same sex, the congregation said, no, the church does not have the power to bless the unions of the persons of the same sex. Why? Because sinful unions or sinful actions can never be blessed by God, very simply. Again, that teaching is reaffirmed in this most recent document. The 2021 response added that individuals with homosexual inclinations can be blessed if they're showing the will and desire to live according to God's will. This new document adds that couples can be blessed as well. So in many, way, in many ways, that's the sticking point, uh, talking about blessing irregular couples. The church is saying couples can be blessed, but their unions cannot be blessed. So sinners can be blessed, but not their sin. And the blessing that the church is talking about here are in situations that are informal, spontaneous blessings. Like when people come up to a priest on the street or at a shrine, they say, Father, can you give us a blessing? It's not talking about bless a blessing in a liturgical rite or a civil union ceremony or a marriage ceremony or anything that would look like you're legitimizing sinful relationships. It's very clear about avoiding those things. 
I believe that the church is trying to say to us priests that in these cases, the object of the blessing is the persons, not their relationship. Since the object, since what I'm blessing, cannot be their union, if the union is sinful, then the object must be the persons themselves. Couples has to refer to persons, not to their union. That's how you can understand this new directive in a way which doesn't change or compromise church teaching. Some people are saying, well, you can't separate the couple from what unites them. I understand that observation, but I think the church is asking us precisely to do that in these situations, to make that distinction between the persons and their relationship. And I think that the bishops that are even specifying this further in their own instructions, saying that persons or individuals are blessed, not their union, I think that the bishops who are understanding it and interpreting it in that way are actually doing what the church is asking of them. The German bishops had previously opened the door to the blessing of same-sex unions and marriages. The church in her magisterial teaching is now closing that door and is saying this is as far as we can go. We'll say that the couples can be blessed but it has to be understood that in no way are we blessing their sinful relationship. So will this declaration be abused and misused and exploited? Of course it will, by the same players, uh, essentially the same ones we all know. It might not be the best analogy, but if our Lord decided to not institute the Eucharist because he knew it would be abused and mistreated, uh, I think we'd all be a lot poorer off for that. Similarly, the church is trying to extend God's mercy to persons who may be living sinful lives, but who are showing some openness to allowing the Lord into their lives. The church is trying to do that, knowing that what she's allowing for will be twisted, abused, misunderstood. The analogy with the Eucharist might not be the best one, but that's the one that came to mind when I was thinking about this. Lastly, the new document talks about prudent and fatherly discernment of the ordained ministers. Meaning, as a priest, I have to be wise when people come up to me and they're asking something from me. I think priests should already know that, right? If a couple who's clearly homosexual comes up to me and says, Father, will you bless our relationship or bless our marriage? I'd have to say, no, I can't. Sorry, I can pray for you. Do you want to say in our Father, Hail Mary, Glory be, together, I can do that. If you're open to it, I can give you a blessing that God will help you to live holier lives and draw closer to Him. But I can't bless your relationship. I'm sorry. Usually a short exchange with people who come up and ask for a blessing can give me an indication of what's really being asked of me and whether or not it's prudent to give it. An inquisition is not necessary when people ask for blessings, but some simple basic questions can be very helpful. Some simple basic questions can also be wise and prudent and fatherly at the same time. So with the heart and with the intercession of Our Lady, let's pray obviously for people who are in irregular situations and sinful relationships. Let's pray that the Lord would open their hearts, they would find Jesus in this Christmas season. Let's also pray for those who are full of animosity and vitriol towards the Holy Father and towards the Vatican and who are openly opposing them because whether they know it or not, they need a conversion as much as the rest of us sinners do. Praise be Jesus and Mary, now and forever.